Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Hoffman. Hello, my name is Michael Hoffman. I'm a trustee of MAS for about 10 years. It's my great uh, pleasure to introduce the next uh, section. Our next discussion speaks to the founding mission of MAS, championing public art in the city. In 1987, MAS founded the Adopt a Mural program, which joined by the Adopt a Monument program in 1991, has gone on to restore and protect 51 works of art throughout the city, from the rocket thrower in Flushing, Meadows Park to the bell ringers of Herald Square, MAS has emerged as the steward of historic works of art throughout the five boroughs. That's what we've done thus far. Very interesting listening to the Brownsville uh, group earlier talking about how important art is in restoring the life and vibrancy of their neighborhood. So with that, uh, to discuss the role of art in New York, our, our MAS president, Vin Cipolla, and my dear friend, internationally renowned photographer and conceptual artist, Bettina Whitfield. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, and a big thanks to Matt and to Ruben and to Gail. That was a tremendous conversation. Okay. And I need my glasses. <laughs> so otherwise, we're completely doomed. Okay, and I've got this, and so we're in good shape. All right. So Bettina, this is a conference about urban design and livability and how to make a more resilient city and how to deal with climate change and population growth and aging infrastructure and how to make room for everyone, how to protect and nourish entrepreneurship in New York it's a, it's a con conference asking questions about equity and opportunity and about the policies that are going to help or hurt realizing those goals. And it's about New York's place in the world and whether that matters. Um, uh, Ann Pasternak, uh, the brilliant uh, uh, director of Creative Time, and uh, Christy McClear, wonderful MAS board member, um, Christy yesterday, uh, and Anne this morning said it's very important to pay attention to the artists. Uh, as an artist, through your past projects and through the one you'll be opening in Brooklyn next year, you're demanding that we add another dimension to our thinking about place. It may not be fair or it could be an oversimplification uh, to call it a spiritual dimension, but there is something more you want city builders, city dwellers to be more conscious of the threat of experience, memory, and place. So, perhaps first, as an international person and artist, perhaps we could begin in Berlin. Um, I'd be happy to, and thank you so very much for this incredible opportunity to speak about something that I think is very important and dear to my heart. Um, what you see here is my previous installation from a project that is global and it is a subject is war and why we still have war, and it is called the heart of darkness. Um, this, in this previous installation, what you see is a subterranean space um, that is bene beneath a brewery in Berlin, um, where slave labor, mostly Jewish women, constructed parts of V2 rockets. I used that history to analyze the role of women in warfare, um, both as victims as well as as victimizers. Um, I should say something about place and memory right here. Um, I'm a visual artist, and I find that in today's world, everybody is so much flooded with imagery, and I very much share the concern that Susan Sontag has that people have become indifferent when they regard the pain of others. And so as a visual artist, it poses a problem for me because I wish to address the empathy and be have people become socially active. So one way for me to do this is to use space. I contend that 
space, people when they enter a space subconsciously react to what took place in that space. And so that history of use, that is the dimension that Vin has been talking about, um, that um, I'm demanding, demanding, I would like to see it being used more in cities for um, artists like myself. Um, for the people in Berlin, it was a very intense experience. They descended down and you know, they, they understood all these um, connotations and as a result of it, um, they were moved and they, they were more active about it. And the same idea I'm bringing to New York. Okay, so um, fast forward to New York. Uh, this is the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, where you, you will be showing your next installation when we were soldiers, once in young, uh, in, uh, once in young, in spring 2015. Yes. Um, trying to read my own handwriting here. Uh, <laughs> what, <laughs> what has your experience as an artist been like to work in New York as, as compared to Berlin? I would like to say for starters, I love New York. It's been my home for 30 years. I'm profoundly grateful for all the opportunities the city has given me, including this amazing opportunity right now here. But having worked in France and having worked in Germany, I have to say that the city does not provide a nurturing environment for avant-garde artists. Um, to give you a very simple example, once I had identified the space I wanted to use in Berlin, it took me three months to be able to do the installation. <coughs> I have worked here since four years to get the installation. Um, it costs five times as much to do it here. So in my view, the city has become too expensive. We've heard this a lot here. Um, it has become um, too risk adverse on some level um, to really have diversity flourish that you know creative communities need. And I would like to make a point here that we saw earlier this wonderful film about Bandung. Um, I do not know the city, but I know Indonesia fairly well. And I know Asian cities. And there was the spirit of can do and optimism and openness that emanated from this film. And I find that today New York has become very close down and pessimistic. And um, I don't quite know how to, why, um, I don't know if it's all the economic stress factors here or whether it's still a lingering effect from 9-11, but I do think also it has part to do with the fact that we're living in a country that has been at war for 13 years. Let's go to, um, this, is the, this is the Brooklyn Navy Yard Hospital building, yes, where you will be uh, doing the exhibition next spring. Um, yes, what you see here is a, is a, is a remarkable space within Brooklyn. Um, this is an entire site, and it, it is a building that was um, built in the, during the Civil War. Um, it was then on active duty until the 60s. It was abandoned, and then has been recently bought by Steiner Studios, and will be part of a media and technology um, campus. Now, Douglas Steiner has been so kind and also willing to take the risk to make this building available before it will be converted for my installation. I will be using parts of the, um, I've been using parts of the main floor and I will be using parts of the ground basement for an installation that's called When We Were Soldiers Once and Young and has as its subject matter the traumatization, the physical traumatization, the mental traumatization, psychological traumatization of soldiers, of civilians, but also of medical personnel um, who have experienced warfare. The hospital context uh, really is so interesting. We were talking in the hall outside and also we've been talking over the course of the last two days really about uh, uh, civic commons, civic assets um, because of the, um, the Ebola uh, news in New York now. Uh, it draws even more attention uh, to this uh, conversation of assets in the city with Bellevue serving this very particular role right now, uh, but yet um, within the context of the back backdrop of so many hospital bankruptcies, 
uh, the taking offline of hospitals in the city, um, uh, diminishing civic assets or civic commons, um, as has been discussed in this meeting, but yet, in a way, it's just the timing of your work or the consideration of this site uh, in its history um, as a decommissioned hospital of extraordinarily historic uh, um, importance, of course, but um, uh, it's just, it's, it's really something to think about, isn't it? These, these buildings, the roles that they perform, um, uh, changing world, uh, growing cities, and the actually the increasing importance of, of facilities and civic spaces to care for growing cities, maybe at a time when we actually see um, fewer of them uh, being kept alive or being developed. Fair? Um, fair, but to some <laughs> fair, but <laughs> to some extent, you know, cities grow and change, but and. I, I don't really want, I do not know enough to say something whether like the, the change of a building like the St. Vincent's Hospital into condos was a good or bad thing. But I live in the West Village and my experience has been from the community that the, the building there served as a um, memorial, an unofficial memorial for 9-11. It reminded people of the AIDS crisis, people have a very strong emotional relationship to that building. Mm -hmm. And so when this building was mostly taken down, it created tremendous anger in the community. And I felt one of the things that subconsciously, emotionally, you know, I'm an artist, um, has had to do with the fact that nobody had paid tribute to how the community felt about these buildings. You know, as city dwellers, buildings for us are like landscapes. They, they harbor memories, they harbor emotions. And I think this is something that one might want to take into um, consideration before repurposing or for whatever reason. And yes, I personally would like to still see St. Vincent's. That's my personal view. The, um, the catalytic uh, role of artists, of our public artists, it's so outsized. Um, the, uh, the brilliant work of Creative Time, of the Public Art Fund, of, the, of other organizations that really facilitate this. I mean, so many places that we think of as being so vibrant today are vibrant because artists either had moved there or because artists had created a new lens from which we could look at that place. I mean, many have commented that the city of Miami, you know, is the hottest place around right now, really because the art fair, the Ar Basel Art Fair went there and really helped people connect to it and see it through a different lens. So as Anne had said this morning and as Christy has said yesterday, paying attention to the artists, where they go, what they're trying to show us is a very important thing indeed on many levels. So as we wrap up our little conversation this afternoon, we're looking at, and the audience is looking at, um, uh, uh, um, a view of your this exhibit. Is, this is, yes, this is a virtual installation. This is what you will see. Um, it's inside a hospital building. And to put this, what you see in a larger context, I need to say something, um, which is that um, I fervently believe um, that we can leave warfare behind. Um, you know, as an artist, it is my role to challenge <clears throat> that what you think and already know. And it used to be accepted belief, you know, that um, black people were inferior, uh, that uh, women couldn't think straight and animals were machines. And thank God we have moved on from that thinking. So I'm an abolitionist of art, really. An abolitionist of war, really. Uh oh No, go. Finish your statement. <laughs> Please wrap up. It's, yeah. it's screaming at us. <laughs> wrap up, wrap up. Finish your, finish your sentence. Finish. Okay, I'm <laughs> it's so, it's so aggressive. <laughs> Whose summit is this anyway? It's the first time I'm doing this. My God. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Okay. What I want to rally you people to <laughs> is, is please don't think that war is something that's innate and that we are hardwired for war. It's not true. We are actually hardwired for compassion and we are hardwired for empathy. That's why we have mirror neurons. And war really is an aberration. It shows the neuroses of a society. We can leave it behind. Thank you, Bettina. <laughs> when, um, when is the exhibit in Brooklyn next year? Uh, April, April. April of 2015, you're brilliant. And you're all Thank welcome. You so it's much. free to the public.
Thank you. Thank you.